Welcome back to another great edition of the Cross Border Interviews live edition of the show. Today I am pleased and honored to start our Conservative Leadership Candidates series that we're going to be hosting live on the podcast on the YouTube channel. So it's going to be live on YouTube and then a few days later it will be released via audio version via Spotify. So if you don't want to watch it, you can tune it in uh, while you're working, working out, going for a walk. Either way, you can just tune in and listen to the episode later. And to start off our Conservative Leadership uh, Candidates uh, series, I'm pleased and honored to have the man himself, the, uh, I think I can say, Saskatchewan business owner, conservative leadership candidate, Joseph Borgo. Joseph, thank you so much for doing this. This is an honor and a pleasure. Well, thank you, Chris, for having me. It's my, uh, my pleasure as well to be here. So, Joseph, uh, I have started every single interview I've ever had off with the exact same question. You're no exception to that. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, I think I grew up with it. My parents uh, had a deep love of community, uh, both mom and dad, very community-oriented people, uh, love of family, <clears throat> which led to uh, dad founding a manufacturing business. but. Um, you know, uh, yeah, love of community and uh, helping people. You know, I've always, all my life, I care about people. And, and when I see people uh, suffering or hurting, um, you know, it's something that, uh, uh, that drives me to, you know, if I feel called, and obviously I'm a believer, and I listen for God's guidance and wherever he guides me uh, to the best of my ability to in interpret where he's leading me and guiding me, I go, you know, and I feel the country's in a lot of trouble, a lot of trouble, more than I've ever seen in my lifetime. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, I felt like I had to do everything in my power to, uh, with the vision that I have, to, to get the country back on the right track again. So that's in a nutshell what got me into this. We talk about uh, a lot of things on this show, policy, why you decided to run, but I want to start off, and I start off with a lot of these questions about the man behind the candidate. Let's talk about your upbringing. Let's talk about mom and dad. Were you a very political household? Was your mother and father political? Or are you the black sheep of the family and kind of the odd man out and just decided that politics was going to be something in your life? So. I grew up in a Roman Catholic, uh, French Roman Catholic community, French but also a mix. We had uh, all cultures in the community, but it's predominantly a uh, Catholic community. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and, you know, both my parents, I felt like I was blessed with the best parents uh, that I, you know, that a, a son, you know, that I could have had. And I had th uh, three other siblings, an older brother, an older sister, and a younger brother. And, uh, uh, you know, mom, were, mom and dad were incredibly honest. Uh, we, I, talking to my siblings, uh, my sister and brother Claude, uh, we've never had any memory of them ever lying or twisting the truth. Or Honesty and integrity was just as we grew up with that, honesty, and, and we brought that into our businesses. And I lived 66 years like that. I can't say I was always 100% honest, but I learned early on uh, in my teens the, the importance of honesty and integrity. And, and with that, you build trust, right? That's how you build trust with people. So, you know, when you're always honest, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly parts of we deal, things we deal with in life and in business, uh, then people begin to trust you and so I was very fortunate in that way so that's from a moral character point of view that's the environment I grew up in and uh, <clears throat> did you get were you raised on the idea of giving back because a lot of people who get into politics I ask the question why give back in the political realm as someone who was raised as a Roman Catholic giving back is kind of enshrined in you at a young age were you, uh, was your family well known to give back to the community that usually gives so much in return? 
Well, yeah, like I was saying earlier, you know, mom and dad, any leisure time they had, they were always giving to the community, you know. Um, and when I grew up, uh, we had, when I was a very young teenager, in my early teens, uh, my, uh, I think it was, I don't know if all my siblings, but for sure my sister and I were in a, uh, a non-profit organization for teenagers called the Brew Teens. And what we would do is we would go around and help elderly people clean up the town, clean up uh, abandoned uh, yards, you know, cut the grass and that sort of thing. We would do bottle drives. We'd sponsor uh, teen dances, which were a real blast, you know. Uh, so this was in the 60s when the 60s <laughs> music, you know. Uh, so I, I, I loved uh, growing up in St. Brew. I think not only did I have the best parents in the world, but I also had growing up in St. Brew was just, it was a, at times a tough community, but also a, a great community to grow up in, you know. Was politics and religion kind of go together, uh, but from time to time people might say the separation of church and state. When you were growing up in the Roman Catholic Church, did you ever think politics was going to be in your future? Because you talk about being a 66-year-old, was that ever a inclination that you might ever decide to run for politics or as you talked about in your first uh, statement the calling at this age was the reason why you got into politics this late uh i would say uh we were like my siblings uh my older brother jerry older sister rita and my younger brother claude and mom and dad uh, especially especially our father was uh we would have traditional dinner and supper together, breakfast, dinner, supper together, and politics and world affairs. It wasn't just what was going on in Canada or in Saskatchewan. It was what was going on in the United States politically, uh, <clears throat> what was going on in the world, in world politics. We were very global in terms of uh, uh, studying and, and discussing what was going on in the world. So we, I kind of grew up with that part of it. But as far as an inkling that I would ever run for office, I would say it began when Pierre Trudeau was in power. Uh, he was prime minister from 68 to 70, uh, 84, 16 years. With a nine-month gap for the uh, for those for those historians yeah. that are listening, yeah. Joe yeah. Clark was prime minister yeah. for nine months. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I remember that well. Yeah, uh, the problem I I you know I voted. Uh, uh, we all have we all make mistakes in life, right? And I voted liberal <laughs> in 1974 when I was 18. But then I think of what, uh, uh, you know, this is a, a joke, uh, Winston Churchill had said, if you don't vote liberal before the age of 30, you don't have a heart. But if you don't vote conservative after the age of 30, you don't have a brain. And uh, so forgive me to any liberal uh, listeners. <laughs> MPs it's, right it's now a, who are listening. <laughs> it's, a, it's a joke, right? Uh, but uh, my inkling really began in my mid-20s. Uh, well, in university, I had gone to listen to Pierre at the university. He had stopped in. I was a few feet away from him. Uh, he had come and given a talk uh, when I was in university. And, uh, you know, I admired Pierre uh, Trudeau because he, he was very witty. He was one of the wittiest politicians I'd ever listened to. So I kind of admired that about him. But uh, by the age of 20, you know, two years after uh, I had voted liberal, I could see that he was a tax and spend liberal and it just that bothered me a lot. I could see that that wasn't good for the country to have somebody just spending uh, like he was spending. And uh, I, you know, I, I guess I was a commerce student and so to me reckless spending uh, troubled me. And so that's when I, I could say I, I got interested. I started thinking, okay, why are people voting? Uh, liberal like that for somebody that's you know wasting their tax dollars like this why and so that's when my I really began to question and study politics and I always studied leadership the best leaders in the world like Abraham Lincoln I studied uh, Abraham Lincoln's life read five books and studied his life um, you know uh, uh, Ulysses Grant uh, Margaret Thatcher uh, I love Margaret Thatcher loved uh, President Ronald Reagan uh, so I was always very political in that way. I never felt any inclination to run for provincial politics. If I thought if I would ever run, it would be 
uh, federal. And in my tw mid 20s, I began to have that interest in possibly becoming prime minister someday. But it bothered me actually to have those thoughts. So I would just keep giving them up, up to God because I didn't want to ever egotistically become a prime minister just for fame. That didn't interest me. The fame does not interest me. The, the money, whatever would come uh, with Paul, that's not my interest. Uh, my interest is in doing the right thing. My interest in leadership is always to, you know, I all, in my leadership years, I would always go wherever I felt there was a, a need and where I was drawn in where I knew I could provide the leadership. I love conversations like this because I'm always impressed when someone says something like that, what you just said, that you're not in it for the ego. You're not in it for the fame, the fortune. You're in it for the right reasons, right? And don't get me wrong, I think there's a lot of people out there who are in it for the right reasons. Sometimes they don't win, sometimes they do win, but they're few and far between. I want to talk about uh, your announcement to run for the leadership of the Conservatives. Why Why now? You talked about that call that you got at the beginning of the interview. What was that call? And why now? Well, you know, when I see where there's leadership, where it's, you know, it's 70 or 80 uh, percent, that uh, I don't feel guided to get in and try to compete with that, you know. Uh, <clears throat> But where I see like what's happening in our country right now, and this has been going on, I began to see the train wreck, uh, the train going off the tracks early on when Justin Trudeau, and I kind of figured that's what would happen, simply because, you know, put it this way, you know, I'm CEO of a manufacturing company, I employ about 80 people. Uh, I was actually CEO of a larger company when I was 29 before I had to deal with my health problems. and. Over the years in business, whenever we would promote a manager or even myself being promoted to general manager of the Borgo Cultivator Division in 1985, I knew why my dad hired me to take on that position. He One, he knew I cared about people and I had proven myself over a period of years, about 10 years, that I had the competency, competency skills to be in that position. He knew I would work my ass off to do a great job. And... And uh, so when I see politicians run for office, young people who have, don't have the life experience, don't have the leadership skills, have never built an organization or balanced a budget or had to do a payroll, and I saw that when Justin got elected, I thought this, this could be real trouble. And uh, so, uh, and I see that right now. A lot of the, the politicians that are running for office, you know, uh, no disrespect to Pierre, he's got his strengths to Pierre Polyev, but he gets out of university and right away ends up in politics, so professional politician. I, I don't feel that Pierre has the ideas or the life experience or the skill set that I have uh, to be the prime minister. I think to be a prime minister, you've got to have a wide variety of skills and you've got to be skilled at leadership, uh, managing large groups of people. Uh, building teams, and you've also got to have strong moral character, and that's developed over a period of years so that nobody can corrupt you. Um, and ideas, uh, the ideas, the innovative ideas to help uh, unify the country and to help uh, get the country on the right track of health, happiness, peace, and prosperity. And I feel I have all those skills, you know, so that's what compels me at this time. To, to run. That's, I apologize for the long answer on that. I love long answers, especially on a show, because it gets to the heart of who you are. Mm -hmm. Because I have interviewed over 400 people for this show, and I can tell you I have had interviews where they give me long answers, and I can tell that they're passionate about it, they are sincere about it. And then I have had politicians who gave me the, the state, the canned answers, and I hate that. Yeah. Because that's not the true person who's behind the, 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 the candidacy. Yeah. And the fact that you're willing to be honest, sincere, tells me more about you than an interview would ever tell me. Like mm -hmm. a brochure would ever tell me. And I know for those who are listening know that I love brochures. But 
an interview, an actual conversation between two people tells me more about somebody than a Twitter or a Facebook. And and yet again, I want I, I would love to have Pierre come on the show and talk to him as well. But you're right. He is a career politician. And there's a lot of things in the last six years that the conservatives have accused Justin Trudeau of. And one of them is being a nobody and then entering into politics. Kind of like Pierre, he university right to an MP, pensioned by 31. You talk about your leadership skills, and I want to dive into that a little bit because I found that fascinating. What sets you apart? What about leadership do you bring to this table that other candidates, and not just Pierre, but John Charest, Leslin Lewis, uh, Scott Atkinson, uh, a few others, that they don't? Yeah. So, you know, I've, I've not studied the life of any of these people. I, I don't come on to shows with the intent to run them down, you know, that's... And that's not my intention, yeah, no, I do apologize I, that. No, no, you're not saying that. Uh, I'm just saying, uh, like, uh, so maybe I'm not being fair to you in what I just said here. So, I, you know, to say I have some understanding of them, like Leslie Lewis was a, you know, was a lawyer, and, and, and Pierre just got out of university, you know, I, uh, and, and ran for got into politics and and I don't want to fault them for that either because that's their interest and that's their path of yeah life. that's yeah that's what they what interests them but when you're talking about leadership unless you've you know I've been involved in building uh, organization and fairly large organizations I've been in crisis situations and unless you've been in those situations managing crisis uh, you know it's like that's trial by fire and and I can't say in the earliest um, uh, crisis situations that I was in, uh, you know, panic is something you run into and you have to overcome that when you're in leadership positions, you know. Uh, and so uh, that builds your character. When you're put in really tough positions where you've got to correct major problems and people are depending on you to solve those problems, customers are depending on you, your employees are depending on you, you're put in a, like a pressure cooker. Uh, in managing crisis situations. So that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is you're, 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 you're building teams of people. And so you, you, in order to do a good job of running any organization, uh, you've got to uh, develop the principles of how to uh, lead and, and guide and manage an organization to build teams of people. You've got to promote the right people to positions of leadership to make sure that you've got people that as you give them more and more power and authority that they're not abusing that power and authority. In business we have a saying, if you want to know the character of a woman or a man, just give them power. Uh, and by that I mean make them a supervisor or a manager and watch how they treat people. And so you, you'll know the character of a person by how they how they treat people and how they deal with problems and so I grew up through all that and I'm not putting myself on a pedestal here I didn't manage it perfectly all along the way and that's maybe why I'm this late in in my career uh, deciding to step up I feel like uh, uh, I've developed the moral character that's needed that a lot, lot that happens in people's a position of power especially politics they can be corrupted by money or you know fame, uh, you don't stay grounded. The more power you have, you lose grounding, and and so you've you've got to stay grounded. You've got to stay humble, and you know the way I stay humble in that way. Like for me, I believe we're all God's sons and daughters, and there and in God's mind, in God's eyes, none of us are superior or inferior to one another. We're all on our own path of each our own path of awakening. And, but I don't think myself superior or inferior to other human being. I don't, I don't think those thoughts, and I don't look at other people that way. I think you're a son of God, and I should treat you with all the love and respect in the world that I can. And I try to see every person in that way. We have... We, I, I asked you this beforehand, then we stopped in our pre-interview, but I want to talk about it here for a few minutes. Because leadership comes with unity. You can't have a good leader without bringing people together. And 
you are relatively new on the conservative blog. I don't think you are a well a known name. How will you be able to bring people together from British Columbia, from Nova Scotia, from Metro uh, Metropolitan Toronto? How would you be able to bring them together for the best of the country? Because as I said in the pre-interview, we are in a more divided time than we have ever been that I've ever seen. How do you envision with a Borgo's Conservative Party of Canada being able to reach out to all Canadians and not just the ones who have traditionally voted Conservative in the past? So uh, the way I see the world, and as this ties into the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, uh, the preamble on the Charter of Rights and Freedoms begins like this. Whereas Canada was founded upon the principles that recognize the supremacy of God and the rule of law. And so all the rights that are in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, they apply equally to all Canadians. The Canadian Bill of Rights, all that's in there, similar to the Charter, it applies to every human being. Uh, the Criminal Code of Canada, the rule of law applies to everyone. It doesn't matter if you're a billionaire or you're on the street, uh, you know, sleeping on the street. The rule of law applies equally to everyone. Our Creator, God, and I'm not speaking religion here, I'm talking spirituality. Our, our Creator loves every one of us. That's how I see the God that I know. Uh, I learned to meditate in 1991 when I was in the depth of a deep illness. I learned transcendental meditation. And that connected me to God. And the God that I know, and the, and the God that I grew up with, the Roman Catholic God that I grew up with, the parents that I grew up with, they loved everyone. You know, uh, what they didn't love, and particularly my father, was hypocrisy, uh, you know, lying, dishonesty, uh, selfishness, uh, greed. Uh, so, to me, to unify the country, what I've learned in business, as it applies, uh, my value system is like this. God, love, truth, freedom and personal responsibility, justice and fairness. So let me say a little faster. God loves truth, freedom and justice. That's how I think. And I think that if we recognize, put God at the center of our life again, and this is how the country has changed. I think that if I do not recognize my creator, then I'm in my ego. And, and to me, the ego, the acronym for it is edging God out. And, and I've learned a lot about that. I've reco recovered from mental health issues, serious mental health issues. And the way I did it was through the relentless pursuit of truth. And the more you seek the truth on every issue in your life, you set the goal of truth, you keep an open mind, you gather the facts, and as you gather the facts, using your God-given common sense, deductive reasoning and logic, you discern the truth of the matter. And then you act on what is true. And when you do that, truth is win-win for everybody. So to me, the way we unify the country is, you know, wherever there's a problem, we set the goal of truth, we gather the facts with an open mind, we listen to what everybody has to say, all the stakeholders in that issue. Take the issue, for example, of equalization. There's, there's, there's a sense of injustice in Newfoundland on this issue and in Alberta, big time. And it's creating division. There's, we have Western alienation. How do we solve that problem? If I were Prime Minister of the country, the way I would solve that problem, I would be bringing uh, all the stakeholders to the table, and that would be the premiers and possibly go deeper than that as well. And, and I would be setting the goal of truth and seeking the facts and the truth of how do we what facts can we work on uh, using sound region, reasoning and logic that everybody could agree to to bring justice to the, this sense of Western alienation or to Newfoundland where they have the feeling where they're, they have not been treated fairly with resource revenues, offshore resource revenues, where the federal government is, is taking the, the royalties as I understand it. This is yeah. my understanding. And so they feel like they've never gotten a fair deal. I remember when Premier Brian Peckford, who I know and met in Ottawa, uh, you know, a great guy, an honest man who fought for Newfoundland, they're still having this fight today. So we have these injustices in our country, and it's a result of, uh, I feel, incompetent or uh, 
you know, to use a more polite word, it's people like Trudeau just does not have the leadership skills to unite the country. And, and it's, it goes deeper than that. I believe he has an agenda that's not serving the Canadian people as well. Trudeau's not been the only prime minister in your lifetime or my lifetime since Pierre Trudeau. Stephen Harper, John Crutchan, Paul Martin, Brian Mulroney, Kim Campbell, and they go on and go on. This problem of unification does not start with Justin Trudeau. He might have exacerbated it a bit, but I remember under Harper, it was you could see the division starting. As the new leader, if elected, you will first have to unify a party after a leadership race. How are you going to do that? And then my follow-up to that is, with the trust of politicians so low right now, so if you go poll everyone in Calgary, their trust in any politician, conservative, liberal, NDP, Christian Heritage, Green, it will be at an all-time low. How do you bring trust back to our democracy in a time when not only conservatives and liberals are fighting, but my neighbors are fighting with each other. Religion is fighting with religion. Countries are fighting with countries. Ontario is fighting with Alberta. Quebec is fighting with the West. How do we start unifying this country? Because we talk about uh, it's been at an all-time low, but let's talk about solutions. Let's talk about what step one is, because bringing people together is great, but if there's no concrete action and plan to get us out of just talking and doing, then we're just going to be here in four years' time having the exact same conversation. Yeah. So what's your plan? Because well, I think there's a lot of people... Go, okay, go ahead. Let's start on the micro level on that. Let's, uh, if if uh, you and I were building a... Uh, you, you and I, it's a pleasure meeting you, Chris, and this is the first time you and I've met. Yep. And I can see you're, you're an honest and sincere man. And so what happens is, imagine if I started lying to you. Uh, everybody's got a lie detector. Yep. Uh, I had attended a conference about 20-some years ago, uh, the Wizard of Ads. Uh, it was in Saskatoon. There were about 2,000 or 3,000 people there. And <clears throat> when he came on the sta stage, he said, the first thing that you have to do uh, when you're advertising is always tell the truth. Because if you don't, people are going to sense Yes. And so the reason that we've, we have broken trust, we have had leaders that have lied to people, uh, <clears throat> you know, and so, and I know they're, because I was in Ottawa, for example, uh, during the Freedom Convoy. And when Justin Trudeau got up and spoke about uh, the occupation and how he spoke uh, describing the people that were there, like it was completely out of alignment with the truth, with the facts on the ground. And millions of people saw that. So how he just b breaks the trust of millions of Canadians. When, whenever a leader gets up there and says something that isn't true, every time you speak a word that is not accurate and not true, uh, you break the trust. And so I feel that's why we have disunity in the country. That's one reason. Okay. So it's important what builds relationship, even, even in marriages, you know, it's really important that, uh, I mean, there's two aspects. One is always tell the truth, but there's another. It's always do everything in your power to be respectful. And so, you know, Gandhi had said this, if you know a truth, you speak it with as much love and respect as you can. Otherwise, people will reject the message and the messenger. So my goal is like, you know, I know I'm using some tough language to describe Justin here, uh, but I don't have an ounce of hate towards the guy. I, I, you know, I just, the way I view it is I disagree with him. I 100% disagree with him because I, how, how am I going to agree when he's lying? How can, I, how, how can I agree with that? So to me, it's we have to call out, we have to find the right language uh, not a hateful language. We should always come from a place of love to describe the situation because, you know, Justin can change. Justin Trudeau could become an honest man if he, if he started, if he understood how to discern the truth about an issue. And that's part of his problem. I don't feel he has the skills. That's largely what's happening. The man does not have the skills 
to be able to discern truth. So he doesn't even know how to build a relationship type thing. It's a lot of dysfunction there. But I still have to call it out uh, for what it is, you know, because otherwise I'm sinning by silence. You know, I'm not going to sin by silence. I'm going to call every situation to the best, and I'm not going to pretend to know the truth about everything either. Uh, because, I, you know, there's so much to learn. There's so many important topics. I would be getting, the way I would govern in my administration, I would be picking the most honest people in the Conservative Party uh, and putting them in leadership positions. And I'd be doing that throughout government, wherever appointments could be made. Uh, because if we're going to rebuild trust with the C Canadian people, we have to have honest, truth-seeking politicians uh, and leaders at every level throughout our country. And that's how we're going to unify our country. You just said something I want to follow up on. And I, I, yet again, I don't like doing the gotcha questions, but you brought it up. So yeah. I just want to make sure that I'm clarifying it for myself, but also for my listeners and yeah. my viewers. You said you would only appoint honest politicians to government or to your caucus or cabinet. Are you saying right here, right now, that there's an honest, there's... There's not truthful conservative MPs in the House of Commons right now? Uh, oh, like, uh, well, to me, in, in the Liberal and NDP ranks, there's... But in the conservative, because you said you wouldn't appoint a honest... You'd only appoint an honest person to cabinet. So that makes me think that you might assume, and I, you never assume people yeah. because I've always been told, if you assume, you make it something out of you and me. So, But if you were saying that you'd only appoint honest people, are you saying that all 119 MPs in the Conservative caucus right now are honest? What I would say, uh, the way I would view that, I don't know them all. I know some of them. Like, for example, I know Kathy Wagenthal very well. Yep. Yeah. And I feel Kathy is a very honest person. I've had a number of meetings with her, uh, and I think she's, I think the world of Kathy. You know, so I would want to get to know them, it, because to me, uh, in leadership, the character of the woman or the man is critical uh, to determine whether or not they're capable of leading. That's number one. If you've got a dishonest person, if someone's got dishonest character, uh, you cannot put that person in a leadership position. In a company, I would never do that. And if I were prime minister, I would not be appointing people that, uh, that I could not trust, that would not tell me the truth, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly truths. I, you, we have to, in order to build trust with the Canadian people, we need leaders that are not afraid to tell the truth. And again, uh, uh, for people skills, you have to have people that can be... Uh, tell the truth, but be respectful, diplomatic, and tactful. Because the goal is to unify the country, not blow it apart. So to me, that's critical, uh, is finding who would be, you know, the most uh, people of high moral character. When, you're, when I'm hiring for leadership positions in my company, uh, I'm looking for men and women of high moral character and competency skill. But above competency is moral character. Competency skills can be developed. Moral character is more difficult to develop, uh, you know, the honesty and integrity. So uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, All 119. Yeah, I don't know them. So at this point, uh, I feel, what I feel about conservatives, generally speaking, conservatives tend to be more cerebral, rational, logical thinking people. So they, their capacity to discern truth appears to me, in my observation in life, uh, liberals and NDP are more heart-driven. And I think what we have to do is we have to have the combination of being heart-driven and head-driven. Like, you know, emotion should not overrule our ability to think clearly, to discern truth. And vice versa, uh, we should not be heartless in our decisions, cold, hard, fact, and heartless in, in the way we, you know, we speak truth or, or the way we implement policies. We've got to have, uh, you know, we've got to have love in our hearts. And, but we also uh, have to use intelligence and wisdom to discern truth, to make intelligent decisions in order to arrive at the consequences that desire. So we desire a consequence of unifying our country. And that means all Canadians, right? I'm not saying half the country or one third. Uh, you know, I, if I were elected prime minister, I would want to govern for all Canadians and I would want to be doing my best 
uh, to unify, I don't care what your political stripe would be, the only way that I know that you can unify people is recognizing, uh, to me, God is our creator. He loves us all, and he wants us to work together in a spirit of cooperation to solve all the problems we have here in this country to create heaven on earth for everyone in this country. And so, you know, as a spiritual person, I wouldn't be bringing religion in, but spirituality is essential because if we don't recognize God as our creator and the creator of the natural scientific laws that govern our health here on earth, uh, we're lost. Yeah. And so we need these principles, God loves truth, freedom, and justice, in order to, to unify the country. And so that's the kind of people I would be putting in positions of leadership. I want the leaders to work to unify our entire country. So I'd be working with liberals or NDP or anybody to find win-win solutions. Now, I'm just, I just checked the time here. We're 30, 38 minutes into this, and I, I, I haven't asked you a policy question yet. And I'm about to hit you with some policy questions okay. here. You have been touring across Alberta, Saskatchewan. You were up in Slave Lake. You were down in Airdrie. I think you were down in uh, southern Alberta here for a few days. And then you were back in Saskatchewan, northern Saskatchewan. What are you hearing from uh Canadians right now because I'm assuming you want to get to Ontario get to Quebec get to Eastern Canada because I know you talked about being in the Freedom Convoy but what are you hearing from Canadians as you're crisscrossing as you're talking to them about the issues that are important to them because you have to remember leadership candidates and I say I will say this to all of them you are the leader but you have to remember who who's voting for you the people's policies the people's issues are the things that you're going to have to address. So what are you hearing? Well, for you know, we would all understand this. The people who, who lean towards, uh, let's say, conservatism or, uh, <clears throat> you know, I, I, those are a lot of the people that are coming to my rallies. But I'm also meeting with people who, for example, you know, uh, I'll be honest with you, I did my research uh, and I did not take the experimental gene therapy, right? But the way I view that and the way we uh, manage that and led that and manage that in our company is that uh, we recognize the Charter Rights and Freedom. We recognize that everyone has a God-given free will to decide for themselves how to protect their own health. And so we did not judge or condemn anybody in our company if they chose not to take the vaccine or chose to take it. We, we continued. You treated them as Canadian. Yeah. So Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, <clears throat> we, I had people that I know a lot of people who have taken the, this experimental uh, uh, you know, vaccine. And uh, I, don't, I don't think of them any less for doing so. And so uh, touring around, uh, like the, the majority of people that are attending my rallies uh, or rallies and or events where I'm doing public speaking, uh, <clears throat> I would say probably the majority want, all they wanted was the freedom to decide for themselves whether or not to take a vaccine or not. And I respect that. And so, uh, so that's an example, but I, I speak to the issue. I'm a principled guy, and I believe in the God-given right and freedom of freedom of choice. When we think about that, nobody gave you free will, but somebody gave you free will. It wasn't the government that gave you free will. You came into life. My, my six-year-old daughter taught me the, the principle of free will. When I asked her to clean a room and she wouldn't, uh, she's 38 years old now. Please tell me you told her at 38 you told her to clean her room. Because oh, yeah. That, we, that would be the best freedom of choice right there. We, we laugh about it because, uh, you know, I spanked her because she wouldn't clean her room, right? Last time I spanked her because she had, uh, Lee's had a very powerful free will. And so, uh, you know, I just, uh, I understood that. Uh, Do you? Yeah. You, you, you are here. You you're here in Calgary right now. You're doing the Southern uh, Calgary tour right now. You have spoken at the uh, and mandate and, and and the mandates uh, rally downtown Calgary on Sunday, which I saw you speak at. Uh, you are uh, you are in Airdrie uh, coming up. You're in Olds. You're coming up. You're out in Lloydminster coming up. You talk about 
earlier on in your previous statement that you have to listen to everyone. And understandable, you're going to rallies where more conservative-minded people might go. Not saying that they're all not conservatives, let's be honest. There might be some liberals. There might be some independents. Everyone's there. As the next leader, you will have to reach out to everyone because you can't just win Alberta and Saskatchewan and be prime minister because we see Aaron O'Toole do that. We've seen Andrew Scheer do that. How are you reaching out to the party base that was there that left for Justin Trudeau in 2015? Yeah, just so I'm understanding your question here, I'm sometimes uh, get, I got to listen with the understanding. No, no, no. So I, I'll, I'll rephrase it here for a second for you. What are you doing to speak to all okay. Canadians, not just the conservative Got base, yeah. but the liberals? Because you can go to your rallies, you can have a rally, you you are in Airdrie, you are in Olds, you are here in Calgary on the 24th, you are up in Vic Juba on the 27th in Lloydminster, my old stomping ground, if you are in Lloydminster and you're listening to this right now, head out to the Vic Juba on up April 24th, 27th, sorry, from 7 to 9. Joseph will be there, and he can ask, answer some questions that we didn't get to chance to get to. But you have to reach out to more than just the people who want to come listen to you. So here's how I reach out to them. The common ground that all Canadians, that I believe all Canadians have, is to be healthy, to be happy, to, be, to have inner peace in their lives, uh, you know, to be able to work to fulfill their dreams and, <coughs> and, and do things in their lives that they enjoy doing, to have financial freedom, uh, you know, to be treated with respect by, and, and never to be lied to by their politicians, by their leaders. Uh, so, uh, and that's where, so the vision that I have is to create a healthy, happy, peaceful, prosperous, country where all Canadians can work to fulfill their dreams, but within the rule of law, within the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, within the rule of law, within the rule of criminal law, and of, you know, God loves truth, freedom, and justice. Yep. The policies that I will be implementing, and I, I'll talk a little bit about the policies. Number one, it's a principle. I want to get rid of the vax mandates right away because forcing people the word, it's not really vax mandate, it's forcing people to make medical decisions against their free will or else you lose your job. Well, if you look in the criminal code, that's section 3461, that's called extortion. You either do this or else you lose your job. That's extortion. Yeah. And so to me, we have criminal activity taking place on in this country. So that I'm not going to violate the criminal code of Canada. Uh, I'm not going to violate the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. I'm not going to violate the, the Canadian Bill of Rights. So that's how we bring people together, is I tell you how, what, how you choose to protect your health. That's your choice, not mine. And I'm not going to judge whichever way you do it. I would invite every Canadian to do your research, as I have done, yeah. so that you know how to protect your health. But I'm not going to judge you whatever you choose, however you choose to do it. So that's an example for... To me, when you treat everybody as equals, I want to treat all Canadians as equals, recognizing that they were all given a God-given free will to choose and also a mind to think and reason with, to discern the truth and to make their own decisions. Because that's how we learn, from making decisions. So, uh, so I want to govern in a principled way in that way. So that policy of getting rid of the mandates, that's a principled decision based on the principle of, of freedom of choice, okay, and personal responsibility. So the next thing, I want to get rid of the carbon taxes. And why... I think you just won Alberta. <laughs> yeah, why do I want to get rid of the carbon taxes? Well, I'm a manufacturer, been manufacturing all my life. And I've been working uh, diligently to keep jobs in, in Canada and the United States, in North America, and not ship them off to China. I've been fighting that battle in our boardrooms for years, in our management meetings, and for the most part, we've succeeded in doing that. 97 to 98% of our products are, uh, the suppliers are North American. Leth Iron in, in, uh, in Lethbridge is an example of a major supplier for us. I want to keep those jobs here. And, and, 
And, and so what the carbon taxes are doing, it's making Canada uncompetitive in the world economy. So what's happening is manufacturers are taking their products and they're going to China and getting China to manufacture their products. And China is 28% of the world's emissions, CO2 emissions. We're one and a half percent of the world's or 1.6% of the world's CO2 emissions. Over 60% of the electricity in China is coal-fired power. In Canada, it's 9%. And we have some of the cleanest coal-fired power plants in the world. So what we're doing, and, and that's what I mean about uh, these, the Liberal NDP do not understand that what they're doing with the carbon taxes is they're driving up the cost of living for all Canadians. Inflation is rampant now. Uh, and they're making our businesses uncompetitive. So they're driving all these jobs over to China where they produce these products at a way higher rate of pollution than we do because they don't have the regulations we do over here. This is not rational thinking. So I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate sure. with you here because that's the great thing about yeah. the show. I can do it. Um, they will say we got to stop climate change. We got to curb climate change. We got to put a cap on what emissions we're putting out there. Understandable. China's another issue. And I know as a federal leader, you will have to deal with world issues, not just domestic issues. But you have to deal with whether you agree with it or not. Climate change is something that the Liberals and the NDP are talking about. What are your views on climate change? And how do we address the middle of April <laughs> and we are getting a massive snowstorm right now? How do you deal with climate change? Or do you even believe that climate change is real? Well, uh, climate change has been going on since... Uh, you know, since the day we, we, you know, we we were created and existed on Earth. Okay, so that's one thing. It's difficult to know uh, uh, where where there's natural events occurring and where man takes over. And so this is how I deal with this issue. And I've studied it. I researched and wrote a manuscript on it, uh, making sense out of the Kyoto Accord in 2005. I spent months studying the issue. And what I've realized, uh, you know, to just talk about CO2, I think that that's been incredibly harmful to unifying people to take action. And what I realized about it is what we must do is I, 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 we've got to, we have a responsibility to preserve and protect our environment for current, the current generation that's on the planet and for future generations. So there's two sides to this coin. One is we have a responsibility to do everything in our power to clean up any pollution of our, you notice the word? I'm not saying CO2. I'm saying pollution of our natural environment. We have a responsibility to develop the technologies that can uh, stop and prevent. Uh, to, and I'm talking to inventors that are doing this. So we can develop, I develop technologies to clean up the environment. I've been eating 100% organic food diet since 1992. I've been cleaning up this inner environment. And when I'm, every dollar I spend buying organic foods, I'm rewarding farmers to grow foods without the use of any substances that could be harmful to the environment or harmful to human health. So to me, the environment is very important. I support I've given to Greenpeace. I'm still giving to Greenpeace. I'm still giving to Ecojustice. I'm still giving to Canadian Physicians for the Environment. Monthly donations to these organizations. And I've been doing this for years. I don't see that uh, it's either you, you destroy the oil and gas industry or you protect the environment. That you have two choices. I think they go hand in hand because the more profitable the oil and gas industry is, the more money they have to invest in research and development to clean up uh, any form of pollution uh, in, the, in the environment. And they've been doing it. My son-in-law worked in the oil and gas industry for 14 years, and he would list off the examples of where the oil and gas industry has been working hard to stop polluting the environment. And so to me, it's not either or, you have to do both. You have to have a strong oil and gas industry in the country to keep uh, natural gas prices competitors so, so that low-income people can afford to heat their homes, so we don't freeze our citizens. 
and power their vehicles and their diesel trucks and, and, our, and our trucks that, uh, so that they can haul freight around, haul food to people. Uh, so to me, uh, the, the idea that we have to think win-lose, uh, that to me is egotistical thinking. Win-lose is, uh, truth isn't uh, egotistical thinking. It's not win-lose, it's win-win. I think win-win. And I think we can have a clean environment and a strong economy both. We don't have to kill uh, our oil and gas sector in order to have a clean environment. Now you are the only Saskatchewan candidate in this leadership race. Um, you are currently on your tour of Alberta, and I guarantee you there's one person screaming at their YouTube channel right now or yelling at this afterwards when they listen to this, saying, where does he stand on pipelines? Pipelines, pipelines, pipelines. Which pipeline would you want built first? And I say that first because I think we need to get more than just one done to get our natural resources to market. Would it be Keystone XL from Hard City, uh, Alberta, down to uh, Texas? Would it be Northern Gateway, which would take our pipeline from Alberta to BC coastline? Or would it be Energy East, which you would have opposition from at least one premier, his name being Francois Legault? Which one would you want to see start it and complete it first? Well, you know, I'm not an expert in that area. Uh, I'll say that first. So where I don't have expertise, first thing I would be doing is setting the goal of truth and I would be pulling all the stakeholders together on that uh, to, you know, the, the leaders in the oil and gas industry as well as the premiers of all the provinces. Uh, and I would be trying to discern the truth based on the facts of where, uh, f so for example, I studied the issue. I researched and wrote a book in 2018, 2019 titled The Way of Truth. It's a manuscript, I haven't published it, but it, it, there's 52 chapters, and I kid you about this, because there's 52 chapters, because I like to play with a full deck of cards. <laughs> so in my research, I discovered that, you know, we do have a pipeline uh, to, uh, to uh, Quebec, and 44% of our oil uh, from Western Canada, or 44% of the oil in Quebec is coming from Alberta. Uh, or and the West. So a lot of people don't understand that. Uh, the other thing that I learned in my research about that is that the oil refineries on the East Coast use a lighter uh, crude oil. They're set up uh, to refine lighter oils than the Alberta, uh, you know, oil sands oil. It's a heavier oil. Now, uh, to anybody that's listening to this, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm out to lunch, you know, you can send me an email and, and correct my ignorance on this. But where I'm going with this, the point is that there are nuances. And so in order to make intelligent decisions, and this is what I'm good at, I'm a problem solver, been doing it all my life. I would get all the people together, honest, truth-seeking people, uh, uh, you know, together, and I would be in pursuit of truth to find out which pipeline would be maybe the easiest to construct that would provide the most benefit would it, you know, because, uh, for example, uh, right now, uh, the Keystone Pipeline is blocked in the United States by the Biden administration. And so that might be an immovable wall uh, until Joe Biden is out of office. So why beat our head against that wall, right? So I would, you know, and if, if we're looking at a pipeline to the east and the type of oil that we would be sending out there would be a problem in any way, shape or form, then, you know, by attrition, it may be the, the best route out would be uh, across uh, through BC uh, to export it uh, offshore in that way. So you, you go through a decision-making process and, and by uh, elimination, you, you find out what, what is impossible. Let's say Joe Biden makes it impossible. Okay, that precludes that. So it's either going east or west. And, and by, you know, just by pursuing the truth, you'll be able to narrow down uh, what is possible, what's doable, you know, so, and, but I would want to involve all the stakeholders, obviously along the way, there are, you know, if, you, if that pipeline to the west, let's say, is, and it's being built, Trans Mountain is being built, right, right now, so uh, maybe that is the logical way to go. Uh, 
And I appreciate you, your answer on that. Uh, I just checked the time. We're coming up at the hour mark. I can't believe it's almost an hour. It feels like it's only been like 20 minutes because we have had such a great conversation so far. But I, I, I told you an hour and I want to make sure you get to your next event, but also have time to relax tonight before tomorrow, plus the snow. But I want to end on this question. And look at the camera for this one. This is This is you and the camera. This is not talking to me. Why should you be the next leader of the Conservative Party of Canada? Well, uh, that's for Canadians to choose. Uh, so, and I'll respect their decision, whatever it is. But I can tell you, I have the moral character. I believe the moral character. My loyalty and my service, I would be, uh, if you elect me as Prime Minister, I'm going to serve you, the Canadian people. I'm not going to serve uh, any corporation or any unelected foreign organization like the UN, uh, the World Economic Forum, or the World Health Organization. I'm going to be serving you, the Canadian people. You, uh, you can't serve two masters, and to me, uh, I would be there to serve you, the Canadian people, the people who elected me. Uh, so that'd be one. And I believe I also have the leadership skills honed over decades uh, to know how to unify the country, uh, to bring people together. I've done it in my businesses to get people working together. And the other thing, I believe I have the policies. Uh, and, and, and if we had the time, we didn't touch on it, the tax system. I would like to discuss that as well. I believe I have the ideas that to help all Canadians to be able to make choices and decisions in your life, to be able to afford to be healthy, to be happy, uh, to be you know, peaceful and to be able to work to fulfill your dreams. I believe I have the ideas, many of the ideas that can help make that happen. Plus, I would be, of course, uh, gathering the best ideas from Canadians. Uh, you know, I believe that as Canadians, we can solve our problems here. And especially with God's help, if we ask for our Creator's help, uh, working together in pursuit of truth in a spirit of cooperation, there is no problem that we have in Canada that we cannot resolve working together, and I call it Team Canada. I'm looking to build Team Canada here. So with that, I want to talk about taxes, and then we'll wrap up here finally, because I, I did talk about that beforehand. We were going to talk about taxes, and let's talk about taxes. Um, we are struggling right now. Canadians from coast to coast to coast are struggling. As you said beforehand, supply, uh, supply chain issues are causing... Uh, some backlogs. We are seeing the cost of goods and services going through the roof. How would you, uh, how would a Borgo government help and help the average Canadian? Would it be through tax cuts? Would it be through a flat tax? What are your policies that you would be putting into place around our tax system that we as Canadians so often love filing in at the end of tax season. Well, let me put it this way. Uh, we've never taxed a business before it was profitable, ever, in the history of our country. So we have the analogy to that is the true poverty line right now, uh, which I upgraded in my book, updated in my book, uh, The Way of Truth, uh, the true poverty line average across the country, and it would be higher or lower depending on the region of the country, even in the city, but the average is about $50,000, okay? That's the true poverty line in the country, okay? And I can prove this mathematically on a budget. It's all math. It's 1 plus 1 equals 2, okay? Yeah. Numbers don't lie. <laughs> Numbers do not lie, okay? So what we're doing right now, federally, you earn $12,000, Every Canadian that earns $12,000, you start paying 15%. Every dollar over and above that, up to 46000 approximately, you're going to pay 15% federal tax. And depending on the province, you're going to pay 10.5% uh, to 15% income tax. Well, that's the equivalent of taxing a business before it's profitable. So what we're doing is we're basically we're bankrupting Canadians. Our governments are bankrupting Canadians. So what happens when you do that? Well, the only thing that Canadians can cut is their food budget. And so they live on macaroni and cheese, cheapest foods they can find. So what are we doing when we're taxing our citizens when they're living below the poverty line? 
we drive them straight into the medical care system. And in this country, every provincial budget is spending 40 to 45 cents or more on their medical care. I, you notice what I said, on their medical care spending, not health care. Not health care spending, medical care spending. And so I want to create a true health care system in this country. And the way we're going to do that to help every Canadian to be healthy and happy and to have mental peace uh, is we're going to raise the standard deduction from 12000 federally to 50000 over a four-year period. And I would work with the premiers to do the same all across the country because it's not sane. It's not rational. There's no common sense whatsoever to be... It's insane to be taxing our citizens when they're living below the poverty line. The, the follow-up question to that is, where do you make that money up? Okay, where, uh, my answer to that is where the money is right now. It's in the medical care system. We're spending $270 billion a year in Canada on medical care. And if we took $70 billion of that and gave it back to Canadian citizens, uh, we're going to save way more than $270 billion uh, I'm, sh I'm sorry, we're going to save way more than $70 billion a year if we give Canadians the money to be able to afford uh, financial ability to afford a healthy diet and lifestyle. We're going to get Canadian people out of the medical care system and it's going to reduce our medical care costs. And Canadians are going to be happier. They're going to be more productive. They're going to earn more income because every dollar when you're living at or at the poverty line, every dollar you spend, it goes back into the economy to create jobs, to get the economy going. And, and so, and then once, the other thing I would do with that is I would like to allow income splitting up to $100,000 and a $20,000 deductible per child. The problem we have in this country is that we are dying as uh, the, the, the people who settle this land, we're dying out. Uh, because of our tax system, our birth rate in 1950 was 27 per thousand, 27 children per thousand people. Today we're 10 births per, per thousand. So we've had a 67% decline in our birth rate in this country. And it's because our tax system is taking away parents' ability to afford a healthy, to afford to have children. So I want to create a pro-life culture by allowing parents to keep what they earn until they cross, till they're profitable, till they cross the true poverty line, and so they can afford to have children and to have healthy, happy, and you know, well-balanced children. And if they choose to have a mother or father in the home to look after the family, to prepare healthy meals, and to you know, look after the kids, so the kids have have a uh, have a parent at home. You know, so those are some of the ideas that I bring that no other candidate brings to the table. You're a business owner. You're sitting in a household that is a sole proprietor. I am a sole proprietor. I have a company. I'm a business owner myself. Uh, over the last two years, I've struggled as a business owner because, A, businesses are taxed at a certain rate, and we always seem to get crapped on at tax time. I filed my taxes every year. I've paid my taxes every year as, as a relatively new business. My first year taxes has been the highest I've ever paid in my entire life combined. Now, you, it's great that we can talk about individuals, but what about those mom and pa shops? What about me? And I, I hate to be, I know it's the, we're not supposed to talk about me on the show, but no, let's talk, I, let's about, talk about me yeah. for a second. My tax bill in my first year of business was $30,000. And that would have been on a net income of what? About ninety. That was 30000 from province, federal, and municipal. So what I would say is that small businesses, the way I view it, there's kind of two tiers. Like a small business, uh, what you're doing, self, you're self-employed. Yeah. So you're, you're basically feeding the system. Yeah. So... Uh, I think small businesses should be, uh, th the max that a small business should pay should be in that 10% range, uh, a federal combined federal provincial tax. Yeah. You know, uh, <clears throat> when you get into, and uh, to me a small business would be say anything under, 
you know, I, I'm just picking numbers. I haven't put a lot of thought into. And don't that. I'm not. I don't want to put you down. Like, do not say something you. Well, you're, let's you're, say you're, on a net income of a million dollars, up to a million dollars. If you had a million dollar, your first million, I would say for for a small business because you're creating employment not only for yourself but for others. You're doing a heck of a service to the to the country when you're employing people. Yep. <laughs> okay. So I would say up to a million dollars, ten percent, and above that, twenty one percent is what I would say. Now, when it comes to individuals, if I can go back to that, yep. over $50,000, I think that once you cross the poverty line for individuals, I think we should have a 25% flat tax. So if let's say from 50,000, you're up to a million dollars, you would pay a 15% federal tax on that 50 to, uh, from uh, 50 to uh, a million dollars, you'd pay a 15% flat tax federally and a 10% flat tax provincially. So you'd pay 25% flat tax. So you could file your, ta you're an individual, you could file your tax return on a, po on a, on a postage card. You know, you had a million, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so beyond a million, I think we... I just want people to start talking about this. The last federal election, this is why I, I was up front with everyone who's ever come on the show. I went in and I spoiled my ballot because I could not vote for any of the parties because none of them spoke to me, the sole proprietor, the business owner that is struggling through this pandemic. Because while we have lockdowns, and I know restaurants are feeling it, I know the tourism sector is feeling it as well, but there was nothing to say, here's how we are going to help you. We're going to keep more money in your pockets and at the end of the day, help me hire more people to get my job done. But no one was saying that. So I, I just, my, pl my plea to the candidates, and especially you, Joe, Joseph, sorry, give me a policy I can vote for because that's well, what I want. I think uh, a t the way we're going to get our economy rocking and rolling, we saw what uh, President Donald Trump did in the United States. He lowered the top corporate tax rate to 21%. And he got the U.S. economy uh, humming, you know. Uh, he got people that were investing offshore, co uh, companies that were... Because companies can move, larger companies, they can move their, you know, their cash and their investments offshore, in, in, off the country in a heartbeat. So we have to have a competitive tax rate. So I think the top corporate tax rate should be 21%. And so I would say any revenue over a million dollars... Uh, you would pay a 21% tax, uh, corporate tax. Anything below uh, a million, you'd pay a 10% tax. And for individuals, again, over 50,000, you'd pay a 25% flat tax, 15% uh, federal, 10% provincial, up to a, up to a million dollars. Over a million to 100 million, you'd pay a 30% flat tax, uh, individual. Over 100 million, uh, up to a billion, you'd pay a 35% flat tax. Over a billion, uh, uh, we're going to take 100% of your income because the, the billionaires are the problem right now in this world. And I kid about that. I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek. I think over a billion, we take 50% of their income because, uh, you know, I feel that... But I, there's loopholes out there, and you know that, and I know that, and I, I'm not trying to interrupt you, but billionaires are become billionaires because they don't... They play the game. And you and I know that. Well, that's why we call it a flat tax, though. We legislate a flat tax. So if you earn over it, let's say you earn, uh, you earn, uh, well, let's say. So Mark Zuckerberg, yeah. he makes billions of dollars each year. But his salary is not a billion dollars. His salary is like yours and mine, probably, yeah. well, because he gets paid in dividends. So, okay, so let's say Facebook was here in Canada. Uh, every dollar that they would earn over a million would be a 21% flat tax on their income, you know? Yeah. So we've got to get the higher income people. We've got to remove the loopholes from higher income people. Uh, we have to have a military in this country in order to uh, protect our sovereignty. And so to me, nobody, if you live in Canada, you have to, and you can afford it, you're living above the poverty line, you should pay your fair share so that we can fund essential federal government services like the military. 
And, and that's another area. Maybe we'll talk about another day. Yeah, we'll have you on after this because, uh, like I said, I don't want to take much more of your time. But, um, Joseph, I want to thank you. I, I, I come into these interviews very green because I want to learn from you. And I, I've been following your campaign since you announced. I did a little story on your campaign announcement video. And I was like, okay, let's see where this guy goes. And I, I, I never know how interviews are going to go because I try to have an open mind and an open heart when I sit down with people. But over the last hour and ten minutes that we chatted, I have come away with three words that can describe you. Sincerity, honest, and passionate. I wish you the best of luck in the next few weeks, in the next few months, until September 10th. You have an uphill battle. I can imagine you you know that because you got to get out there and introduce yourself to Canadians from coast to coast to coast. But if anyone who's here is listening to this, who's watching this at a later date, um, the links to Joseph's website, social media are in the show notes. Go there, learn more, reach out to Joseph uh, directly. The, uh, his email address is there as well. Um I'm assuming you're up to answering questions if people want to ask them. Yes, yeah, the, to the best. I'm having, I have trouble keeping up with it all, but we're, for the most part, I've got some assistance and we're doing the best we can to answer questions. So absolutely, I want to hear from Canadians as well. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. We've had a good showing throughout the night. Um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in. I want to thank Joseph for coming in. If you're out in the Airdrie Old area, uh, follow Joseph's Facebook page because he will be in that area. Next week he's in uh, uh, Lloydminster, Saskatchewan, Alberta, my old stomping ground, as I said at the beginning of the interview. Go out to the Vic Juva from 7 to 9 on the 27th, if I'm mistaken. Don't quote me on that. Go to his Facebook page and you'll actually find out the date and the time yeah. that there. Um, but remember, everyone, I, I, say, I say this over and over again, and th this conversation has reiterated it in my mind. Go have a conversation with somebody. I know that's a weird concept in today's age when everyone wants to get behind social media and bash the other person or send a tweet in 240 characters. That doesn't help our society and our democracy. So get out, go have a conversation, go get involved in politics. Our democracy only happens when we are an engaged public. So go out, learn about Joseph, learn about the other candidates, get a membership if you think that the person that you want to support best represents your values and your morals and vote 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 so with that my name is christopher brown have yourself an excellent day joseph thank you once again for doing this. thank you very much chris greatly appreciate it i really enjoyed this i did too so with that have yourself an excellent day everyone and we will chat later for another live edition if not we'll be back monday for another episode with premier bill vanderzam the former premier of british columbia until then talk later guys